That was an excerpt of Philip Larson in The Vanity of Words, composed by my guest in this episode, Roger Reynolds. My name is Paul Steenhusen, and you're listening to the Sound Lab New Music Podcast. The occasion of this interview is New Music Concert's event on the Royal Conservatory of Music's 21C Festival. The concert takes place on Sunday, May 27th, and includes music by Claude Vivier, a new piece by Brian Harmon, and two pieces by Roger Reynolds, Not Forgotten for String Quartet, and a new piece, Calling Still, for Flute and String Quartet. We began our conversation talking about Not Forgotten, a piece in six movements titled Giverny, Eliot, Yanis, Toru, Rioangi, and Now. It's a piece dealing with memory of people and places. In this case, Roger Reynolds' composer friends, Eliot Carter, Toru Takamitsu, Yanis Zanakis, and the places Rioangi in Kyoto, Japan, the Aegean Sea, and Giverny, France. The piece is concerned not only with the music of the aforementioned individuals, but in their ways. I asked him to elaborate. One of the things that I've been fortunate enough to learn as a result of a long life that has involved a lot of uh, peregrination and a lot of interactions that continued with substantial composers, other kinds of artists, I've come to know not only the work, but the people behind the work. And the thing which is interesting because it emerges over time is whether that maps well back and forth. In other words, whether the music, I mean, obviously the music always has to reflect the person in some substantive way because I don't think we can ever be untruthful in in art if we're committed. Uh, So the music always says what we know, what we think, how we feel about the world, whatever our intentions are, that's unavoidable. And so a question which arises, I think it used to arise a lot in regard to Cage, but of course not only Cage, is uh, whether he was really like his music or whether his work really reflected what he was. And I think in his case, this was a very central purpose for him, that the work and the life should be inextricably bound up with one another. So what I mean is, uh, you know, Zanakis's uh, string quartets are an aspect of what he was. That was the Arditi Quartet performing a bit of Yanis Zanakis's Tetras. But surely not all of what he was. And the acidic aspect of the music, the aggressive and almost intimidating level of the music was, of course, there when you interacted with him. But he was actually quite a, a gentle person, filled with irony, and certainly quick to assert not only an intent, but the fact that he'd been injured in some way. So, uh, and Takamitsu, everybody that I knew who knew Takamitsu, it was frequently the case that people would say about Takamitsu that he was severe and not quite arrogant, but difficult to approach. And I had never seen anything like that. And at one moment, near the end of his life, last few years, he mentioned that there was a concert in Boston of his work. He was resident at that point at New England Conservatory, and there was a concert there, and it'd be great if we could come. So we went. And after that concert, there was a reception, and I saw for the first time Takamitsu with his face on, unapproachable. It was was quite an amazing moment, because I saw in that situation where there were these actually lines of people bearing offerings that they wanted to put in his hands and into his life, and which, of course, he did not welcome. I saw that aspect of him. So that's the kind of thing I mean. I lived in 
situations with many of these people that, let's say, a normal you know listener or artist who knows and admires the work would not have actually experienced. So there was an extra thing there. And what about Carter? We just heard the Pacifica Quartet performing a little of Elliot Carter's third string quartet. Karen and I were living in Paris on her Fulbright grant in the 60s, and through a circumstance we don't need to go into, uh, we found ourselves with a car. I had paid the princely sum of $28 for it. We found out that Carter was at the DAAD you know, situation in Berlin, and we had the crazy idea that we would drive to East Berlin and through East Berlin and, and meet with him. So I don't remember exactly how the approach went, but it was provisionally agreed that we would arrive and he would see me. So we drove, we arrived, I got through the inquisitorial prelude of dealing with Helen. And then he said, sure, come over this afternoon. And we talked and we had a very interesting time. And from that time on, we used to see Elliot and Helen in various contexts, mainly in New York, but also they came to Santa Monica often as a function of the Getty Museum connection. So we saw them a lot, and they were very kind, very generous to us, and and acted as sort of uh, admirable elders. Here's an excerpt from the Elliot movement of Not Forgotten, in which he works with material from Carter's third string quartet. With Xenakis, you had several things in common. One being that you, you came to composition a bit later. Another is that you were both engineers, and he was an architect and your father was an architect. Did, did that somehow inform your interaction? or? It, it certainly in, informed it in two ways. Uh, one was never discussed, that, and that was... I guess the uh, echoes, let's say, of the architectural connection, my father and his background. What we did talk about was the, um, the significance of graphic representation. So for both him and me, the idea that one could portray uh, sonic phenomena or musical aims graphically, which is to say not with musical symbols, but in a more generalized way, Uh, let's say particularly in such a situation as metastasis and those surfaces that he generated with parallel lines. I think we both understood that we were very comfortable with the idea of portraying musical ideas in a somewhat uncommon fashion. And I think that that idea was certainly shared and helped us to be immediately more communicative with each other. Uh, it wasn't like a test. And, and in, in that regard, I did know, that is to say, Yuji Takahashi told me that when he first came to Paris to meet Zanakis, that Zanakis asked him if he knew mathematics. And Yuji said, no, I'm a musician. And Zanakis Ooh. said, in effect, come back when you know mathemat- mathematics. So a year or so later, Yuji came back and said, I know mathematics now, and by the way, your calculations are wrong here, and pointed out where he had made uh, mistakes. And another thing Yuji said was that at one point when he was, quote, studying with Zanakis, uh, he gave him a score to look at, and Zanakis pointed to a passage and gave him an eraser. <laughs> I, I didn't have that kind of uh, experience with him. I didn't have that kind of relationship with him. Maybe it's because he perceived me as being somewhat more collegially or oriented. You know, I don't know. We never discussed that, that kind of thing. But I think that the factors that you mentioned 
were certainly components of an ease that we felt with one another. So getting back to the piece, I mentioned three composers who are connected to this string quartet, and you've devoted one movement to each of them. Right. And also three places. Now, going back to Xenakis, Xenakis used, you know, stochastic procedures and probabilities, and you work very differently. Yes. Using serial procedures. How do you write your own personal music that is either about or reminiscing or connected to other recent music that is in fact composed in such a different way? For a long while, I think this was one of the, uh, the elements in the way I thought about my composing that was almost rote. But I always fiercely resisted the idea of any quotation in any regard. So at the time that I was at Amherst College, in the, I guess it must have been 1988, uh, as a visiting professor, whenever I go to you know, an unfamiliar locale, I always try to absorb what's there and to make music with it in some way because that's the sort of fresh input you know, that may arouse fresh output. So in the case of Amherst, it was poetry. And of course, it started off with Emily Dickinson. We went to her house. I was obviously staggered by her poetry, but it just didn't go anywhere for me at that time. So I had Helen Vendler's book on American poetry, and I was reading it in the evenings in Amherst, and I came upon Ashbury's Self-Portrait in a Convex Mirror. And it was unlike anything I'd ever encountered in poetry before. I would, uh, let's say, lying on the couch at night before going to bed, I would read a passage and I'd say, you know, I think I really get that now. I understand what that's about. And I'd wake up in the next morning and look at it and not understand it. And this idea of the uh, frailty or mutability of comprehension was really fascinating. So I decided, okay, I have to write about that work. So I found a number of fragments within the text that I found appealing. And one of the things that Ashbury's text does is, of course, migrate between different periods of history, going all the way back to Parmigianino, but, but also musically he mentions a passage in the Mahler Symphony. Here's John Ashbury reading from his 1974 poem, Self-Portrait in a Convex Mirror. The poem refers to the late Renaissance painting of the same name by Parmigianino. A breeze like the turning of a page brings back your face. The moment takes such a big bite out of the haze of pleasant intuition it comes after. The locking into place is death itself, as Berg said of a phrase in Mahler's Ninth. Or, to quote Imogen in Cymbeline, there cannot be a pinch in death more sharp than this. For, though only exercise or tactic, it carries the momentum of a conviction that had been building. Mere forgetfulness cannot remove it, nor wishing bring it back as long as it remains the white precipitate of its dream and the climate of sighs flung across our world, a cloth over a birdcage. So I went to that work and looked at it and realized that Mahler was in fact quoting Beethoven's uh, Lebevo uh, Piano Sonata, Op. 81A. And so I thought, well, that's got to be there. So the idea that unexpected, and I actually never asked John whether he knew that the Mahler was a quotation itself, which, of course, deepened his perception in a wonderful way. So I thought, okay, I'm going to undertake for the first time uh, a, a direct quotation. Let's listen to the opening of the first movement of Whispers Out of Time, entitled The Soul is a Captive, which quotes the Beethoven directly in the high strings. (laughs) 
So what I did was to take the two passages, the Mahler and the Beethoven, and create a kind of very concentrated harmonic distillation of those passages, and then make row-like structures, linear structures, which related to the actual pitch structures, not transposed. I basically never transpose. So I always use the thing as it was, as it is. And so I did that, and I also quoted transformed versions, especially at the very beginning in the first movement of the Beethoven uh, opening. And what I found was that the, the harmonic, what should we say, shadow of the Beethoven and the Mahler really suffused the whole work, as I suppose almost inevitably it would have to if the you know, schematic pitch structure out of which things were built themselves were built on these particular moments that I felt were crucial in the two works from which I was uh, deriving material. So I don't think anybody would ever have heard the quotes themselves, even though they're quite straightforward, but everybody did hear the resonances. And I think that's why it won the Pulitzer Prize. There was a kind of speaking out of the history of music that people sensed whether they understood it or not uh, consciously. That was the opening of the last movement of Whispers Out of Time called The Portrait's Will to Endure, which shows the Mahlerian influence. And so from that time, from time to time, I've started quoting things, sometimes from myself and sometimes in, you know, from other composers. And most recently, uh, in the context especially of two books of piano etudes, I've, I've gotten very involved in quotation. And what I generally do is, is the same. It, it, this was not true in Whispers Out of Time, but it is generally the case, and it applies to your question that you ask eons ago, <laughs> which I am now getting to a re, you know, specific response for. What I do is I have a, a, a harmonic orientation, let's say, of some sort or other. There is always some kind of a central guiding structure of pitch relationships in every piece and they are not maybe responsible for everything that happens but they're because i don't like rule bound things but i like principled things so the the pitch structures that i begin with are principled and they tend to dominate in the way or shadow in the way that the Mahler and beethoven did in whispers out of time so what i do basically is I know that the harmonic space that I'm working within is relatable to the actual events in the quote. So what I do is I'm composing, as it were, my own music. And as I go towards the moment in the piece or the movement or whatever, where the actual quote occurs, I modify what it is that I'm doing 
so that it becomes rhetorically more and more like the music which is genuine from somewhere else. And then when the quote is done, I do the reverse. And in the case of the three movements of uh, Not Forgotten, what I'm really doing is identifying passages and then finding, of course, a, a passage which I think is particularly representative of what I want to get out of that composer and the relationship I have. For example, in the case of the Carter, the quote is from his, I think, third quartet, and it's one of the rare moments in his uh, chamber music which seems to me to really be lyrically intense. And I think he's not, in general, what I think of as a lyrical composer was not. But in this moment, there's the, just a, a short phrase, a, a bar and a half, two bars. And so that was the thing that I wanted to deal with. Was that the high cello? Yeah. Yeah, right. Okay. And so that's the long answer. I move from the uh, basic harmonic and probably also temporal in one way or another, normatives that I have decided will apply in a particular piece. And then as I approach the moment of a quote, I modify that to come as close as I can to the nature of the reality of the quote. And then I pass away from it. And I, I really find this delicious. And it's sort of, you know, how, let's say, daydreaming might work that you start in one situation and then you, you know, your mind kind of somehow makes uh, unintended subconscious links to something else right. and you find yourself remembering a day 10 years ago or right. whatever. Let's listen to some of the Yanis section of Not Forgotten, in which he works with a portion of Xenakis' piece, Tetras, followed by his description of why he chose it. particular moment, especially with tremolos and irregular uh, emphases, uh, articulative uh, uh, assertions that I particularly like always. And like I could have chosen, uh, let's say, the section where there is kind of uh, strange uh, uh, squeaks and squawks that sound like some kind of a demented conversation, but I couldn't do that because I was already going to do that for Rio Anji. So I went, I went to Tetras for him and for Takemitsu. I went to uh, a piece that he wrote in relationship to his collaboration with uh, Teshigahara and uh, Kobo Abe, uh, The Woman in the Dunes. Right. And this was uh, Dorian Horizon. Here's a bit of the movement Toru, which includes material from Takemitsu's Dorian Horizon. So those were the, the three quotes in that piece. And I thought that they were, they, let's say they, they had to do with my view of these people because the Carter was, I thought, something that he did not frequently allow himself but was there. Right. In the case of Xenakis, it was that edgy irony that's always there, at, at almost but not completely aggressive. Right. And then in the case of Takamitsu, it's just the lushness and the, the pleasure of indulgence. Now, we've so far focused on the three composers, but there are also three places that have the attachments, as you called it, right. for right. the piece. One is Aegean, um, right. the other is Ryoanji, right. and the first movement is which again? Irani. Okay. Now... Is it correct to associate the composer with the place? Uh, it was not my intention. Because it almost works. Yeah, I know, but uh, no, it's not, it, it's not intended. So the, I mean, Giverny, because of the lushness of the color and the 
the fluidity that comes in part from the complexity of its gardens and in part from the failing eyesight of Monet at that point. And that, so that was there, and Rianchi was about dry, hard things, gravel and rocks. And the Aegean got uh, connected to Xenakis, of course, and that's a, a part of the Yanis uh, uh, movement also. Right. And then I realized, uh, really subconsciously, because I had not planned this, and I think that this is probably almost always, again, as as I mentioned earlier, uh, the subject of the truthfulness of what one does. I think that uh, one can't avoid being consistent in one's works if you're really engaged, right. whether you plan it or not. Right. So I had this idea of beginning each of the movements with a solo of one of the four musicians in the quartet. And then, of course, I had the problem that there weren't enough players for the number of movements. Right. So it turned out that I decided to end the quartet with the movement called Now, and that's a, a, a 2D exercise, extremely difficult to play well. And uh, it turns out that that is, in fact, the solo that introduces, if you loop around, the Givrenie, which begins. And, you know, when I was doing it, I really wasn't thinking oh, this is a solo that will make everything come out right. But then I just noticed that that's what was happening. I hadn't consciously planned it. And uh, this is what one of my teachers at the University, University of Michigan called the bonus rule. Yep. That is, if you really plan carefully, you get all kinds of things you do. You create your own luck. Yeah, exactly. Here's a little bit of the final movement of Not Forgotten, entitled Now. Your entry point into the Toru movement is Woman in the Dunes, which has a thematic underpinning that relates to sand and granularity. And then yeah. at the same time, Riranji, the movement, is about the rock garden. Right. However, I see, I see the Riranji uh, reference as extremely articulate and dry and abstract and difficult whereas the reference in Woman's in the Dune is is fluid 
Okay. Um, and and shifting and imprecise and moist, in part not because the sand is moist, but because of the imagery in the film, where because they're at the bottom of the pit, they're right. always sweating and wet, and you know it's it's an extremely interesting and bizarre film uh, in that regard because here they are in a, in a, a sand dune. And it's as though they were in some kind of uh, you know jungle right. setting. Uh, it's so wet and, and uh, steamy, shall we say? Yeah. In various ways. Yes. So, uh, when I was connecting the the person and the place, the Zanakas Aegean made perfect sense. The Rewanji and the Takamitsu made good sense. For Giverny, you you were inspired by the sketch of Monet. And yet, then there's Carter, who we think of as New York, right? Yeah. Greenwich Village. So what I, what I wanted to ask you, and which I'm not asking you now, mm-hmm. is um, what the connection would have been between Carter. I mean, we know he studied with Boulanger, he lived in France, but we wouldn't think of um, associating Carter with an Impressionist. I wouldn't. No, I think you're right. But one of the things, well, here would be one of these details that one gathered in working, uh, in, in having continuing interaction with Carter. A thing which was emblematic of him and which always amazed me was the flexibility of his mind. And that if you had a conversation one year about some subject, and then you saw him six months, a year, or a year and a half later, and it turned to that same subject again, his opinions had changed right. always. So there was a malleability which maybe is slightly relatable to that particular pastel mm. skit. I was really just blown away by finding in, in a wonderful book of uh, Monet's uh, work that I, I purchased at some point before working on Not Forgotten. I, I saw this you know pastel thing and it was just I was just blown away by it because it was the first thing I had seen by Monet that was that was not uh, representative, that is, it's abstract, just lines, curving lines. So that's what caused me to say, okay, that's, I can use that directly, and I can have you know, musical pitch flows in that modality. It doesn't represent anything, but it, it gives you a kind of uh, aggregate sense right. of richness and fluidity. And, and so on. Let's listen to the opening of the Giverny movement from Roger Reynolds' piece, Not Forgotten. It's performed by the Arditi String Quartet. On a related note, I remember vividly going to see the water lilies at the Jardin de Tuileries and standing at different distances. So if you go up close, how abstract those those paintings become and how crude they become. Just like Chuck Close. Yeah. The pointillism having different effects and um, different perception of it from different distances. Or, or Rothko. I mean, yeah. the Rothko the Phillips collection in, in Washington, just where, where he defined precisely where he wanted a bench to be in relation to the distance from the bench to the wall where the painting hung. You know? That's, that's an, a, a great example of how a print cannot represent what the work is, because it has different lives in different distances. Big, big, big subject particularly as one gets more and more, as I have been recently, getting more and more into intermedial situations. You create something, but the thing that you create uh, cannot be easily shared. So 
then you begin to, or I begin to, think about whether there are forms of high-resolution documentation that can not only give you something on a par with what the actual experience uh, is, but can uh, rise above it and beyond it in some ways. So obviously with regard to like using video, I don't know whether you would ever have seen the video that Mode put out of my percussion quartet uh, sanctuary. I have not seen it, no. But there, there were, we did a recording of that, or primarily Ross Carr, who was a videographer, a, a friend and a percussionist who was in the group that performed it. I mean, he spent probably three months creating a design of a shooting sequence, and the piece is uh, probably an hour and a quarter long, something like that. And we did over a hundred takes, each one with wow. different camera positions and so on. And so when you see it, when you see hear the piece in this DVD context, you experience in a way you could never experience it in reality. Right. right. Because you see everything from a changing perspective of those who are making it. So when you're working with memory, is that a metaphor for how you treat the materials in the music? Well, I could say that when I was at Aircom, that was I had I had three major projects that are common. They were extremely important to my evolution, and I'm very grateful to that uh, uh, institution, primarily Boulez, because I think that what I got there might not have happened had it not been for him. Right. But in any case, the, the situation was that you had an opportunity, I had an opportunity, sort of midway through my life, to spend two years rethinking Everything. I, I mean, I took the commission for the first piece of 1981-2-3, something like that, Archipelago. That was some of Reynolds' piece Archipelago, performed by the Ensemble Intercontemporain from the CD The Paris Pieces, Volume 2. I took it as an opportunity to just rethink everything. Right. And so I just said, okay, what is the most common formal procedure in world music? What's shared by the most different practices and so on? And that was clearly theme and variation, right. which is to say something and then different versions of that something. So one of the things that troubled me about what was going on at IRCOM at that point was that uh, Boulez had become very committed to the idea, to the essential nature of real-time uh, computational response. So the computer had to be in the same temporal you know, structure of events and world of control of the live musicians. And I always thought that was appalling because Firstly, it was technologically not possible at that point, and right. certainly Repon could not and was not done as conceived for at least 20 years after it was uh, uh, you know, written. And, but it was more than that philosophical in the sense that why should we as composers deny one of the most important uh, liberties and opportunities of the composer, which is to be anywhere in time? If you, if you deal only with real time, which is to say samples of things that have already had occurred, then you're always dealing with a memory, remembered past or a reference, and you have no anticipation of futures, which seems to me ludicrous, because we're certainly aware 
in all kinds of musical experiences, even long before that became like a major issue, uh, transformative uh, thematic and you know mood structures and so on. We as human beings don't only remember, we also anticipate, we imagine, we project into some unknown future. And so I just can't get on board with that. Right. And I couldn't get on board with that. So uh, I think memory uh, is, is the reference to things which have already occurred, whereas anticipation is the possible futures of things which either have occurred or have not yet occurred. And so in my music, I'm constantly thinking about, I guess I would say, nascent states, now states, and projected or uh, transformative or extended or more extreme states. In other words, the thing which nourishes where we are and the thing which could arise out of where we are. So that's the way I think about everything in, in regard to music. So it's not, uh, in fact, to go back to Not Forgotten for a moment and the title, uh, that frequently Karen and I discuss titles at great length. And that's partly because it seems to me anyway that a title shouldn't be wasted and that it should have some kind of evocative uh, appropriateness. Right. So. It shouldn't be arbitrary and it shouldn't be arcane, it shouldn't be mystical. Right. So in the case of uh, Not Forgotten, she suggested that. And I said, no, 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 can't do that. You know, it's maudlin. And, and she said, no, 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 it's defiant. And as soon as she said that, I thought, oh, right. of course, right. good. Yep. Not Forgotten. And maybe there should be an exclamation point or maybe it should be in caps or something. But anyway, that's where that came from, and that nuance of attitude is crucial to the fact that that became what it became. You had mentioned somewhere that you had attended, uh, you might have presented it, in fact, a lecture of Stockhausen where he previewed some of the electroacoustic part of Contacta. Yes. And you found the sounds rather grating and, you know, mm. difficult. <laughs> When asked about it, he responded by saying, first steps in a new land. And elsewhere, you've spoken of your appreciation of Roberto Gerhardt mm -hmm. for his willingness to remain personally vulnerable. So the question is, having written more than 100 pieces, how do you continue to place yourself in new creative territory? Well, actually, uh, I'll respond to that with an anecdote, that, which is that Roberto said to me at one point, I'm not sure whether it was in Ann Arbor or Tanglewood, but he said at one point, craft is essential because as you get older, you have fewer ideas and you need to be able to make use of them reliably. Now, I, you know, Obviously, at the time that I had such extraordinary uh, interactions with him, I wasn't experienced at all, so I had no idea what many of the things he said would come to mean. But I don't experience that at all. Uh, I have ideas all the time. It is certainly the case that as one gets older, one has fewer ideas that are acceptable, that, that, you, that you wish to engage with. But the number of possibilities, I, this is just not a problem for me. It's not an issue. I never have any problem thinking about something to write music with or about or because of. I have a relationship with the world, which is 
constantly fueled by experience and curiosity and reading and, and so on and so on, viewing. I had an experience, for example, in January where I went to, I had an Eastern trip uh, booked with appointments in New York and Washington. And it turned out that literally everyone in New York with whom I had made an appointment got the flu <laughs> and was inaccessible. And uh, the Library of Congress was, and the National Gallery were shut down by a, a closure. Uh, you know, oh, the, the government. Oh, right. So uh, just serendipitously, there happened to be a number of really wonderful shows on in New York, in Philadelphia, and in Washington which I went to and spent a great deal of time at. And this was primarily with Rodin and Michelangelo, with Anselm Kiefer and with Munch. Wow. And I came back from that trip, a, it's really, in a certain sense, rather like the first experience at IRCOM and rethinking everything with Archipelago. I had this experience of reorientation and the piece calling still is the first piece that comes out of that. And I'm, I'm very, very uh, interested in what it will be like to experience the piece. And uh, people often ask you as a composer, I'm sure you know, uh, how do you know what this is going to sound like? Right. And it's, for me, it's never a question of how it's, what it's going to sound like in the sense that I know what sounds there will be and what they will sound like. What I do not know is what they will feel like. Right. Yeah. I don't know what the succession of those states is going to say. And of course, I, I have ideas about what I want them to say. But that's a much more mysterious space. I think, I, I, I hope I'm not mistaken here, but I, I think Sherino called it the aura. Could be. Now, your new piece, Calling, still, is based on a tale. I'm interested to know the story and also how you came to know it. As I've mentioned several times in this interview, uh, a lot of the creative projects that I actually embark on come about uh, as a result of conversations I'm having with my partner, Karen. And she occasionally, she decided, oh, I don't know, a year ago that we should be on Facebook. And I said, call me out. I'm not interested in that. She said, well, I'll just do it and I'll let you know when there's something interesting. So every once in a while she would pass something along to me. And I had been in Nova Scotia with Bob and we had been talking about repertoire one night and he had said, you know, there's nothing for flute and string quartet because I frequently play with quartets and it would be wonderful to have a good piece, but there isn't very much uh, that would be of interest. So I said, well, that's an interesting idea, and, and it was. I mean, the thought of quartet and flute was immediately in interesting. I didn't think at that time analytically about why it was interesting. But a little bit later uh, at home, I got a forwarded thing from, I don't know, Facebook, YouTube, something. And it was a, a very romantic kind of portrayal of the idea of a sad bird singing to its lost mate. Right. And it was very clear that the material, the sonic material on this had been massaged mightily. It wasn't at all bird-like, but it was like maybe a dream of a bird. Right. A... So I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. And so I, I started poking around on the net to find out more about it. And that led to a more and more serious engagement where I wrote to a lot of uh, ornithologists and I... Uh, interacted with people at the Cornell Library, which is the most celebrated archive of, of ornithological uh, studies and so on. Anyway, I was in touch with people in uh, Australia and in Hawaii and all over the place. And uh, little by little, I began to get a grip on the story. I'm not sure that any single source tells it in the way that I feel now that I understand it. But the basic idea is that there was on the island of Kauai, there was a, a bird, a particular species, this o'o, and it was everywhere, from the shores to the highest mountains in the, on the island. And very intriguing, very lively, and extremely animated kind of bird. Here's a recording of the male o'o bird and the female. <laughs> 
And over the decades after it was first uh, discussed, which was like the probably the 1880s, 1870s, 1890s in that area. And I was intrigued by the idea that the ornithologists have almost nothing at all to say about the calls in the song. It's the feathers that matter because the feathers can be kept and you can say, right. yes, it's yellow, uh, and so on. So the, the songs receive very little attention. And little by little, I saw that this particular bird had a little bit more, you know, was, was spoken of a little bit more in the reports. And one of the interesting things was that both the male and the female sang. And that the female, as I understand the references, was sang similarly but less assertive. So it's a kind of unfortunately sexist behavior. The female is subordinate. But she does at least sing. And so I thought, okay, I really wanted, would like to know more about that. And I tried and tried and tried to didn't really come up with anything substantial. Um, just a little bit in one cor correspondence. So then I got all the sound files I could find, which were all recorded in the mid-1970s. And I listened, and there was one of the recordings which purported to be of two adults. And I listened to that a lot. And I decided I knew which was the male and which was the female. And I then started thinking about, okay, I'll transcribe these things and I'll get to what the essence of these calls are and the song is, and I will have, therefore, a kind of central grasp of how the male behaves and of how the female behaves. You know, I spent probably a month and a half on this. And uh, it wasn't about trying to, well, let's say, messian-like or whatever, use bird song and, and so on and so on. What interested me were, I guess, a couple of things. And one is uh, just very directly, when a species, the males and females, as it were, utter to one another, uh, what's the nature of that exchange and why is it is the way it is? And that's particularly intriguing in this case because it's there and it was noticed abstractly, but none of the ornithologists actually paid any attention to it, which I thought was astonishing, really astonishing. Yeah. The other thing was I thought, well, that immediately put me in the abstract space of saying, well, where does the calling out, what's the origin of the need to call? And are you calling for someone else or are you or something else? Are you calling because you just need to say something? You know, what, what's happening there? So this was against the backdrop of that Eastern tour and all the consideration, especially of Munch and Kiefer. And uh, so I thought, okay, the piece is going to be about a kind of generalized space, which gradually becomes more stable, more dense, more potentially harmonic, and out of which some kind of a need emerges. The first maybe 40, 60% of the piece is about coming to a space where there is something to react to. And then these reactions start. I mean, they are seeded in other ways earlier. And the ensemble tries out different pairings, a violin with a viola, a violin with a cello, a flute with viola, a flute with cello, etc., and decides, as it were, by the last quarter or fifth of the piece, that it's really the flute and the cello. And the cello is the female via all harmonics. The cello part, I, I think it's really quite an amazing part, but I hope that the person who's playing it is, will, you know, get on board. But uh, that's sort of, uh, you know, how it happened. And the thing which interests me especially is something we referred to earlier in our talk, that you know what it's going to sound like, but you don't know what it's going to feel like. And I'm very, very uh, intrigued by this piece and, and how it will turn out. There is also an environmental component to this, too. Is it, are these the last two birds? In the late 70s, there was only one pair left Wow. And that by the mid or early, by 84, I think, I don't know if 84, I think between 81 and 87 or something like that, but in the middle of the 80s, 
the female was not heard anymore and only the male was heard. So there was a roughly seven year period when there was only one pair left. And during the last more than half of that, the female did not appear to have been alive anymore. So the male was calling, but there was, and still calling, right? And so, so to speak, yeah. but there was no response any longer. And they're extinct so, now? No, they're, they're gone now. Yeah. Wow. The species is, is extinct. And this is due to the degradation of their ecosystem? Yes. Wow. And, and to the degradation which occurred as a result of the fame and interest that people had in the, the birds on the island. So they brought rats, the rats ate the eggs, etc., etc., etc. So it's quite dreary. I didn't want to get into being melancholy and, you know, full of regret and sorrow, although it, it is touching, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. The facts of the story seem undisputed, that the that it came down to a single pair, that they moved uh, away from their normal habitat into a swamp, a high elevation swamp land, and that's where that's where they perished. My name is Paul Steenhusen, and this has been another episode of the Sound Lab New Music Podcast. Within our interview, Roger Reynolds mentioned the integral role of his partner Karen while finalizing the title of Not Forgotten. Since the time we talked, the title of the aforementioned new piece has changed, from calling, still, to simply O-O, the name of the bird. Thank you to New Music Concerts for sponsoring this podcast, and to Robert Aitken and David Olds for their ongoing commitment to this interview project. As well, thank you to Roger Reynolds for his thoughts, ideas, and attention to detail. For more information about the concert, go to newmusicconcerts.com. And to sponsor an episode or contribute to SoundLab, go to soundlabnewmusic.com. Playing us out today, an excerpt from Odyssey, an opera in the mind performed by David Robertson and the Ensemble Intercontemporain with Marie Kobayashi and Philip Larson. Que le soleil se lève. Or did I end up by simply sitting down with my back to the wall? All the long night before me, when the dead lie waiting on the beds where they died, shrouded or coffined, for the sun to rise.